All right, I think it's a good place to start. So first of all, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, those that are here live and those that maybe are listening at a later date, appreciate you joining us. Uh, my name is Greg Puig. I'm the head of group insurance here at Sentinel Group. Uh, I've been with the firm for, for a little over 12 years and really my passion is helping businesses with all things benefits. So trying to make benefits, the complicated world of benefits as easy as possible. So that's my passion. That's what I've been doing for a long time now. Um, but I'm super excited to be today's moderator and look forward to hearing from Fallon, Casey, and Salaha, uh, who I'll introduce all three in a moment here. Um, but before I do, a couple housekeeping items to keep in mind before we dive in. Uh, we always get this question, so I'm going to tackle it up front. This presentation will be recorded, and it will be on our webpage for you to access in the future. I even think that those of you that are attending live today, they'll get emailed out to you as well. So um, uh, that, that should be another form that you can get this on. We love questions, especially for today's content. So today's meant to be, there's going to be a lot of back and forth, a little bit of a fireside chat with you, if you will, minus the fire. Um, <laughs> but we uh, we do would love the questions. So we'll monitor the Q&A box at the bottom. That's the easiest way for us to facilitate that. That's okay with you, um, for, for you listeners. Uh, so pop your questions in the q and I'll make sure that I monitor those. And Kendall from uh, our team will also help me with that as we go through the process here. Uh, if we don't get to all of them, not a problem. We can kind of divvy it out and tackle them from there and make sure we reach out to you uh, and get you answers to whatever it is that you might have. But I think I think we should be able to get to them all today, just knowing uh, the time frame. Also, if you're, there's some questions that you have as takeaways after listening to us, don't be afraid to reach out to myself or Kendall and we'll facilitate it that way as well. I know it could be awkward sometimes asking personal questions in a group setting. Um, or maybe you just didn't think of it at the time, we're here, happy to help, and then we can make sure you get answers answers to you that way as well. Uh, but before I introduce everybody, just want to set the stage a little bit for today's discussion. Um, the benefits world is ever-evolving, and can, candidly, it seems like it's getting more and more complicated every single day. Everything from health insurance premiums, um, to health insurance plan changes, to paid family medical leave, depending on what state you were on, you're in throughout the country, just to name a few. Uh, they all add to this complicated world. And for these reasons and more, we're really today going to discuss for part of the time, the role of the broker, or I like to use the term consultant selfishly, um, and how it's a critical one, and uh, and how uh, our, our team and, and, and the people here today um, leverage their broker and leverage their own experience to make sure they give their employees the best experience they can, and to try and make that complicated world a little bit more understandable. Um, really, I'm just super excited to, to, to have this discussion with everybody here today. Um, you know, these three talented HR professionals deal with benefits, um, their benefit partners, growth and turnover within their organizations and their employee base as a whole day in and day out. Uh, in addition, they've had some key transitions, each respectively, that they've gone through over the last couple of years that we're going to discuss um, in their own right. Um, so that's what we're kind of going to be covering today. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't own this up front, just given the, the part, some of the content today, but we are benefits administrator, a trader admitted benefits administrators, excuse me, and insurance consulting team here at Sentinel Sentinel. So we do this, but today isn't about us. The today is about you all and some of the experiences that you're having and how maybe you could have some tangible takeaways from, uh, these three great people today to help you and your businesses. And as you're working with your broker partners, um, so enough from me. Time for introductions. Um, so really excited to introduce all three of these people. I'm going to start with Fallon. So Fallon Carpenter is a VP of People and Culture at Sentinel Group. Um, Fallon joined Sentinel in 2015. In this role, she was responsible for over 250 employees uh, across all of Sentinel's offices in New Massachusetts, New York, and Michigan, as well as all the remote workers we have throughout the country now, which I think is a common theme you'll hear um, uh, over the course of today. Fallon's passionate about uh, passionate and dedicated to human resources and aligns human resources practices and objectives support individual business needs. Um, next, I have Salaha Walsh. So Salaha is joining us as a vice president from InSource Services. Uh, Salaha is a principal consultant for InSource's HR services team. She uses her objective approach um, to co-lead the delivery of InSource's professional services to its clients She's jointly responsible for the overall management of all client success at InSource, as well as providing leadership to and strategic direction for InSource's consulting services and business development teams. 
And last but certainly not least, we have Casey Jobson, HR manager at Star of the West, joining us today. Um, as a human resources manager for Star of the West, Casey is committed to cultivating the company's growth. Star of the West is a leader in the agriculture industry, serving customers in the flour, wheat, bean, and grass areas. Casey's been in human resources, um, including for a long time, seven years of experience uh, in a union environment as a human resources business partner. So really cool perspectives that everybody has today and looking forward to hearing from you all. So we're going to kick things off and jump right into it here. Um, thanks again to you three. Uh, today should be pretty fun. Um, Fallon, let's start with you. Given that you have participants, you're one of the, I think of, oh, everybody's kind of in this seat a little bit, but given that you have participants throughout the country, so employees throughout the United States, right? What do you typically do for open enrollment and, and how have you leveraged your broker to kind of help you facilitate that? Um, and we'll start there and then I can kind of have a sub question for you too. Okay, yeah. Um, so right now, Sentinel has three main offices in Wakefield, Mass, um, Long Island, New York, Torrey, Michigan, and then we have employees in 26 states throughout the country. So we continue to grow our remote population as um, coming out of COVID. But what that does is it has allowed us to have different plans for different offices, which is great, but it creates a lot of challenges for us to kind of remember the nuances of all of the plans. So especially during open enrollment, we really partner with our broker to review those plans, like making sure that the nuances um, that we believe to be true are true, um, understand if there's any really big changes we should recognize with those plans. We have our benefit broker actually help um, put together our presentation for open enrollment to kind of utilize their expertise on what we should be highlighting. How can we engage our staff, especially if we're doing a plan change? What are those big things, key pillars that our employees really need to know about? And then we have our broker actually handle and come in and, and facilitate some of the benefit portions of our meeting. So if people are asking very specific questions, um, they can kind of really get into those areas. And then throughout open enrollment, we just kind of have that open door policy with our broker because there's a lot of questions that employees ask me and my team that we can help, but there's always one or two that are very specific um, that you are like, I'm going to double check this because I don't want to get it wrong because if they pick the wrong plan, um, I don't want that employee um, to not get the services that they need. So really just keeping that um, communication open, reviewing plans, um, and then having them as a resource if we get any specific questions is really kind of that partnership during that time of year. That's great. Thanks. Super helpful. I think another aspect of it too, right, is how you've had to potentially how you've had to look at what your plan offerings are to make sure that they're kind of open enough so everybody has the options they need just given that where they are, right? Is that is that safe to say? Yeah, especially some of our plans, especially being in 26 states, we started with plans that were very much New England based. So then we had to open those up and really look at different plans we wanted to add to hit the needs of people in Utah and California. They're going to be different than what we have in New England. So uh, it's been a journey as we kind of have added more states to our, our listing and employees across the U.S. So definitely. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Um, shifting gears a little bit, Salha, I have, I'm going to uh, go to you next here. Um, you come in with a little bit of a unique perspective, just given your role within InSource and, and what InSource does, right, as HR consultants and, and um, working with a ton of different clients, as well as a principal in your own company, right, for, for InSource itself. Um, but what do you and your team, when it comes to keeping your clients' benefits up to date um, and working with your brokers to do that? What, what do you do to make sure you get what you need across the board for those clients? Um, so kind of picking up where Fallon left off a little, a lot of our, so certainly for us, we're, we're just under 200 people at InSource. And uh, prior to three years ago, I think we had people in maybe two states. And now we also have uh, people in 26 states. So um, our, we had plans that were New England based and we're, somewhat disadvantaged the people that were out of state because they had more limited options. So we've had to look, look at those and work with our broker to um, not only find a plan that would be more advantageous for the people out of state, but to tweak the plan. So for example, we had, a, we had an HMO and a high 
um, deductible PPO. And so the out-of-state staff could only use the high deductible PPO. So this year we're adding a lower deductible PPO, but we still wanted it to be comparable to the HMO in some way. So we built in some um, categories of service that wouldn't be subject to the deductible, for example. Now that will be lost on 90% of the people we try to explain it to. So we really depend on our broker to, I think one really good use of a broker in addition to you know, providing the service and having the competency and the knowledge is also, I think your broker can help to amplify the decisions that you've made to your employee base. So I would hope our broker will say, we, we were, could go with this plan, but we actually did a, a, a customization of the plan to give our employees even more um, generous benefits that address their needs and are comparable to the in-state employees. So that's for us internally. And then we work with something like out of 350, 400 different companies, and they all have different needs. So most of our clients, we provide finance, HR, and IT services. And um, most of the HR clients are probably under 100 uh, uh, employees. Some are much larger, but generally in that space. And so they may have people who their, their workforce needs may shift, like they are having more remote staff and so forth, but not to the same degree that we are, because generally they're smaller. Um, so I think I, I actually surveyed some of my colleagues that do consulting work with clients more actively. And what they said, there was a whole range of people, as I'm sure there are in this, in this group today, some people who are very educated on employee benefits and how they work, and some people who are still learning those things. So I think leveraging your broker to help educate you in what, you, you know, wherever you are, and then also um, to um, kind of script you and help you because as you're reviewing, you know, new, new rates in during open enrollment or as you set up new benefits, people are going to look to you to explain things that you may not be well versed in. So I think leaning on the expertise of your brokers for that has been really helpful for our consultants working with clients because a lot of our consultants are uh, face forward with our, our clients on the benefit piece. So they'll get um, you know, a lot of questions like, why did this go up and why can't we do this? And so the, mo the more effective your broker is in educating on you on those things, I think the, the better the result is and the more confident you are. Yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah, the, the, the thing I'd add to that too, and it's, it's funny you brought it up, we're getting that, I'm getting asked this from a, a broker role perspective a lot right now, and, and also being proactive about it is, the need for that third plan design or the need to have now it used to be right HMOs. I think Fallon and Salha, both of you had mentioned HMOs and PPOs already today. And we're 10 minutes into this thing, but it's been a really interesting change to the dynamic of what was the normal standard plan design of the past and what we're looking at both now, but also for future growth as well, as people look for talent throughout the country, rather than maybe where they did in the past, which was, you know, within bordering states of wherever they were. Um, and, you know, having that option for all, because the thing that you see from a survey perspective, year in and year out, I know a lot of my clients, we're always talking about um, MetLife usually has a fantastic one, survey every year, benefit survey, Kaiser Family Foundation has another really good one. And year in and year out, what they're often saying is that employees want choice, right? That's like the number one thing that they want. And when you can't give that choice to somebody or you're giving it to one piece of the population, but not all, i.e. those locally might be able to decide to choose an HMO or a PPO. And then those outside the area only have the PPO to choose from. That could create some cultural diff differences that could be challenging as well. So I thought those are really good points. So those of you listening, you know, really think about what it is that you have in place today from a plan design standpoint and what maybe you need going in the future in order to adhere to whatever it is, if your employee base did change and maybe it didn't, but if your employee base did change, what you need tomorrow um, to be able to, 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 to um, get in a good space for that. Um, Great. So Can I just add one, one thing? Yeah. Um, another yeah. thing that I think is really helpful to work with your broker on is, so let's just say it was an open enrollment and we couldn't switch plans. To, to think about a lot of the 
design options that are open to you. So if you have a high deduct, so in my in in InSource's case, if we had a high deductible PPO that our out of state employees had, how can we offset some of the um, imp impact that has on them utilizing HRAs or making a contribution to an HSA and and then educating people on those options. Yep, great point. The more you add, the more you have to educate too, right? It's such a, like we said earlier, it's a complicated world. So how can we get everybody on the same page with it or at least try to? Anything um, else anybody wants to add there? All right, perfect. Casey, I'm going to pivot to you now. So this is, I think a lot of people can relate to, to this situation, that the situation that you have, and that's that you have a good mix of just to put it into two categories, I'm not even sure if I'm going to put it the right way, but you'll get the gist of it. A good mix of office staff, right? And those who for you are on the floor to for your other category. So those two, you know, what do you do and what have you leaned on your broker to help with to communicate your benefits to both of those populations? And maybe it's the same, maybe it's differently. Or maybe, you know, do you have, I don't, not sure if you have kind of time constraints for those on the floor that may be different than those that are in the office, but what do you do um, to be able to make sure you're communicating your benefits effectively to each of those groups and, and tailoring your benefits to, to kind of appeal to both of those populations? Sure. I think a couple things. I think definitely um, for our, for our, our locations who are not local to our corporate office, it makes it a little bit difficult. So it's important to make sure that we're educating the managers that see them every day because they're the ones, they're the front line, right? The employees are coming to them. So definitely educating the managers. And then our broker is really good um, where they'll, they'll go where I need to send them. So for example, we had a couple new acquisitions in the past year and uh, our broker has gone there and laid out our benefit plans and said, hey, here's our benefit summaries and here's what we offer. Because um, I think a few of you have mentioned already, right? There's always those couple questions. Like, you know, you can be doing the benefits for five years and there's still a question there that's going to pipe up that you're not 100% sure. And now's the time to make the election and you would hate to tell or share the wrong thing or encourage them to sign up for the wrong part. So I think educating the managers, having a broker that supports you and is either willing to go to the locations or quick at getting back with you so that you can um, get that answer. And um, again, kind of just back to that communication as, a, as an HR department, um, how you get that in front of them and how the people receive the information too, right? For the office staff that sit in front of the computer every day, very simple to send an email. They can even search that email later, right? But our guys or ladies who are on the floor, if you will, um, a little bit harder, right? A lot of them too are not comfortable with technology. So if you send them an email, they may not even have an email for you to send it to. So um, to communicate effectively to them and still keep them in the loop, sometimes that's kind of a challenge. So uh, just again, I think educating the managers comes into play with that and being able to disperse a handout and actually print it and not necessarily have it electronically. Those are some of the struggles that we go through. So. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point because you can think you can take that same concept, right? Because um, we're talking office staff and on the floor, but mm -hmm. I think those maybe that are sitting there listening to that are like, well, maybe we have only people on the floor or only office, so you know it's a little bit different. I think no matter wh who you are, you're going to have multiple generations in the workforce too, right? Yes. And to your point, yeah. Casey, um, people will tangibly like to learn in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, whether that is through a printout or through email or through a benefits administration platform or an intranet site or all the above, right? We have to make sure that we're tailoring, uh, that you're tailoring as HR professionals, your, me your messaging in different manners to be able to appeal to each of those. So I think that's really relevant no matter right. which type of organization that you are. And then you brought up a really good point um, relative to you to, to acquisition. So did you have to do anything differently? Um, and you don't have to, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but okay. relative to your benefits for the new population, kind of similar to what Salaha and, and Fallon were mentioning relative to just employee growth outside of, of the of the their current location, but you had to you acquired. So that even had another wrinkle right. for you too, right? 
Well, it was, I feel that our benefit package that we have really did, um, it was appealing to them because we were acquiring locations that had like maybe 20 people, you know, 30 people. So they didn't have the opportunity to have all of the things that our package with 200, a company of 250 at the time had, right? Um, so it was appealing to them. It was better. It was better coverage, if you will. Um, yeah, the only yeah. thing, yep. yeah. So the only thing that we did kind of have to think about too is now, um, not so much with this acquisition, but just in general, we have to think about our other locations out of state, right? And there might be different plans that we have to have uh, because of different offerings or different regulations that maybe those states have, right? Um, one that comes to mind is auto insurance, right? So, um, so auto coverage in Michigan, we had an auto reform a few years ago with that different coverage. And with our specific Blue Cross plan, um, we do not have auto insurance coverage at all, not even a secondary. For some of our out-of-state locations, we had to change that because they did not have um, they didn't have some of those coverages available to them that maybe our Michigan folks did. Uh, so it's just kind of paying attention to those changes, having the broker help as well to help initiate those or guide you to say, hey, you know, we've got to put them in a different division of the plan or something like that. Um, and just kind of wrapping your head around it and making sure that you understand where it goes and then communicating that effectively to your folks. So that's kind of some of the things that we ran into. Yeah, that's super helpful. Like you were trying to determine where your gaps were, right? Make right. sure that you deployed everything, the resources effectively to try to bridge those gaps. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing that you mentioned was that was, a, that was also really, really a good point is it sounded like you did a lot of pre-work um, to make sure that you had a scalable package so that in those instances, when you have acquired you're able to say, nope, we have this solution today that we could kind of mm -hmm. input these different firms into that um, that made it, if in, in your case, and in some of those cases, an even better experience or benefits experience for those new employees. So that's a really good point, mm -hmm. making sure that you have a scalable package in place today and working with your broker partner to do that so that if something happens tomorrow, whether that be acquisition or new talent, you can kind of just place people in and you know not have to rock the boat for the masses uh, and hopefully make those new people um, even more happy to become part of the organization. So I think that was, that's really two really good points there. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, Valen, I'm going to come back to you uh, going a little off our script here, but um, how have you, so we, we're, we're talking a lot about um, kind of plans, designs, and, and options for staff. Let, let's pivot for a minute to um, kind of education outside of the norm, right? So outside of open enrollment or outside of just a, 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 an acquisition or a transaction, you know, are you guys doing anything um, to unique to educate your staff with your broker, you know, outside of that chaotic, you know, 45 day period as things abut into your, your, your effective date, your renewal date? Yeah. So we try to be really strategic about making sure we present our benefits throughout different parts of the year. Because as many people know on this call, during those 45 days, people sometimes feel like overwhelmed and sometimes they won't even look at any changes. They just select what they did last year and move on because it's like they can't process all the information. It's just information overload. So what we wanna do and what we do at Sentinel is really try to highlight key elements of our benefits throughout the year. So hopefully they have a better understanding when they go into that open enrollment period. And hopefully that helps make them make better choices for themselves and their families. So a couple different ways we do that. Um, in March, actually, we're working on this right now. We actually run benefit statements. So that's an opportunity for us to send them out to all of our employees, highlight all the benefit offerings that are available and which ones they participate in. So it just, again, highlights the value of the benefits we offer, you know, as people in culture and, and folks on this call, you, you put together these packages that help, you hope, provide value to their employees. But if they don't know they're available, the value is gone. So in that benefit statement, we're trying to really showcase like, as an employee at Sentinel, this is all the value that gets added with the benefits that we have. 
Um, and then in May, we like to celebrate May um, as uh, in the past, we've done it a couple different ways, but last year and this year, we're gonna continue to do um, Mental Health Awareness Month. So for that, we actually will work with our broker to really put um, our EAP services out in front in, in front of our employees to give them resources as a reminder that they're there, to utilize them if they need them. We'll also partner and talk to our broker. Um, our carrier today is Blue Cross Blue Shield. So to really understand what offerings does Blue Cross have in terms of mental health, exercise that we can then push in front of our employees. So again, utilizing those carriers, utilizing our benefits to the fullest and pushing them in front of our employees to give them an idea of things that they can do to check their mental health, their financial wellness, their physical health. Um, so again, another opportunity for us to kind of get those out in front. And another interesting one we've done, um, and I'm going to bring it up because I think it would apply to a lot of different folks on this call, is we've actually had our broker um, and carrier come in and do Medicare training, which is really interesting because there's it's it's mind blowing just as a, a people and culture person to hear it. Um, and then thinking about your employees, whether they're trying to retire to really understand what that means for them. And your employees, you might have employees who have elderly parents or parents that are just about to retire. So that education can not only help, it helps multiple populations of people because I know my mom was recently retiring and knowing and, and understanding Medicare a little bit easier was helpful to me to help facilitate that for her. So it's just kind of another offering that you can utilize and partner with your broker on that can really be a nice training and educational piece for your employees. That's awesome. I, I really appreciate that you brought that up just because we deal with that a lot now. I mean, something interesting just in our workforce, I think we have 105 employees right now out of our 350, 370 that are 60 and older. So we have a big chunk of our workforce right now that, you know, they're are people who have always been here, right? They've come forward, they're they're throwing out their retirement dates, right? To have us start planning and Medicare is a big one, right? And mm -hmm. working it with the health savings account and explaining how, you know, you can't you can't contribute to that anymore once you're on Medicare. And you know, it's it's kind of that education. So yeah, that's that's a good point. And I think that that also brings up just the demographics of your group. So depending, so we just did a, we just looked at the demographics of ours, and I, I don't think I have these numbers exactly right, but at least sixty percent of our, it might even be seventy percent of our staff are forty and under. So you know we want to respond like I like I love that idea about the Medicare training, um, because it can help people plan who are participating in HSAs and so forth, help their parents, etc. But then also if you have you know other demographic trends, what are the things that are going to respond to those trends, the EAP and, and utilizing mental health benefits is a great one. And a lot of those EAPs do training in that space as part of the service. But um, also when we were talking about educating people on the benefits, I found that um, when we work with clients who have young populations, not talking in benefit speak is pretty important. So I remember early in my career, I worked with an organization you would know that had a lot hired a lot of young employees. And so if I would say to them, so we have these two health plans, they just shake their head and they kind of agree with me because they didn't want to say, well, like, what is a PPO or HRA? What does that even stand for? So um, <laughs> early on in my career, I just stopped using acronyms and I would try to spell, you know, use the full terms and then say things like, well, you probably know how this works, but in general, and I would do some kind of remediation. And I'm sure anybody here that's in HR can relate to, um, I don't know how many of my my kids' friends have said, I just got a new job and I have this online portal, I have to pick benefits, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> so I think that's a real service, particularly if you have a demographic shifted to kind of earlier in that career. Yeah, awesome, awesome point. Um... Thank you. So I'm actually going to pivot here for a second. I, I think I've used that word too much today, but we're going to move on to a different kind of different uh, different side of things and not necessarily as focused on the broker for a moment. We can come back to that. But I know uh, just from speaking with all of you in preparation for today that each one of you, believe it or not, has gone through some kind of interesting, I don't want to call them projects, but 
big time initiatives that you have driven as HR professionals for your firms that I think that uh, people can find some real value in, and perhaps they might be going through the, these themselves or preparing to go through these. And I think it'd be good if we kind of, if you shared some of your experience with them, and I think it'll make sense here in a moment for everybody, but um, Fallon, I'm going to start with you again, if that's all right. So sure. you did, I know you did a, uh, a big search a few years back to really kind of find, and excuse me if I'm using the wrong term here, but an engagement platform for Sentinel, right? For your employees. And um, can you talk a little bit about that process, what you were trying to get in that engagement firm, and then um, how that's maybe grown or changed for you? And just take us through like the RFP process, uh, or the idea through the RFP process mm -hmm. through kind of you know, fast forward through today and some of the iterations that you've made, because I know that's something you put a lot of time and effort into. Yeah. So it probably was, um, I'm thinking about back now, it might've been in 17. I feel like COVID has shifted years of what has really happened, but I, I believe it was around 17. Um, we wanted to shift and find a performance management system. So we had gone from paper, as many people on this call have, um, and then we were utilizing another software and it just was not working. It, it wasn't customizable. It was just, it didn't work. And so what we said is we really wanted to look out and kind of figure out a, a new performance management system. And if you guys have gone through this journey recently, there are so many great performance management systems, but it's really finding the one that's really gonna connect with your ultimate goal of the system. Um, so one thing I will say is we looked at probably 15 and then we narrowed it down to about five and then from there, I narrowed it down to two more. Um, but what I learned through that journey of um, looking at so many cool different platforms is all of a sudden your head gets really clouded and you're like, these are, this is really awesome, this is really awesome, but it's like, what does your company really need? So if you do need to kind of go through the journey of finding a performance management system that's online, that's um, integrated into some of your other systems, what I would say is to really start with a brainstorm. Like what is the ultimate pieces of, the software that are important to you. And so for Sentinel, it was, we wanted a social recognition spot. We wanted an opportunity for people to recognize each other and to be able to connect at that point in time, just our two off, our, our three offices. So you could kind of cross see what great work people were doing, how people were collaborating and connecting and get a bigger picture of the company. In addition to that, we wanted it to be gamified. So we were, you know, back when we just had three offices, we were handing out like physical gift cards, but not really everyone knew what people were doing and no one really knew unless you got the gift card, like how you got one or, or what it was. So we wanted a way to showcase that great work, but gamify it, which would allow us to give our employees a library of gift cards. And so to kind of better suit that recognition and, and that reward to what they actually wanted. So those are two big pieces. And the third is we wanted, obviously, the performance management system to be easy to use, customizable to what we wanted. And lastly, um, learning management system. So something that could also be a learning management system that we could roll out um, you know, programming to our new hires or managers. Um, that was kind of the last piece. And so knowing that, that's kind of really how we narrowed down all of the great providers that are out there today that can provide performance management. But it was really that social and gamification that um, allowed us to purchase Engagely. That's who we use today. Um, and now, especially having 26 states and 60 plus remote employees, that gamification and social feed is even more important than ever. And we use it for different ways too. Like we'll do challenges on there where people post pictures of their families and we do raffles. Um, so people can really see people's birthdays and they see people's families and pictures. So just nice to have one platform where you can have that. And also you're paying all this money for performance management. So it's nice to have a system where you're utilizing throughout the year, not just maybe twice a year, once a year or four times a year. That system is a little bit more um, bigger than just performance management. And especially if you look at the learning piece as well. So I think the key to going into that endeavor is really outlining the key objectives that you really want to come out with because that will help you narrow down when you see all of the awesome bells and whistles and all of the cool stuff that's out there that you really might not need uh, and you're paying for it. So um, I guess that's just some key takeaways in my journey of um, bringing in a new software for performance and then the training and education piece of it as well. 
No, that's awesome. Thank you. I think that's going to be really, really helpful if somebody's, you know, going to go through that process or in the middle of that process. I think that, that was that was fantastic. So thanks. And Casey, um, going to you. So I, I know you kind of did something similar, I but uh, but with a different system, right? So um, just from some of our conversations, I believe you recently went through uh, a payroll provider change, right? So yes. I think a lot of listeners on here could relate to that. And people always are entertaining. Is that something I want to do? Or sure. we, you know, sometimes there's clients that they're like, they're champions of their payroll provider. Like, nope, I would never even think about it. I love it. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, can you talk us through kind of what you did from, you know, inception on, and I think you're, I'll let you take it from here, but in, from sure. the RFP process through uh, choosing one to kind of deploying whatever it is that whoever it is that you selected, um, I'll kind of I'll, I'll let you have the mic. Sure. So it was time for us. Um, we were at 250 employees and growing and we were using a platform. Um, I don't know that you guys would know it. It's called Great Plains GP. Um, it's really, really great for our services, or it's really, really great for like our accounting with grain. Okay. Um, it's not so much great for HR or payroll, but we made it work because that was the system that we've had for like 25 plus years. Um, but it was time. It was time um, with our with our growing and our acquisitions that were up and coming that we needed, we needed something, we needed a true HR and payroll suite. Um, so we we knew we wanted to go with four. We wanted to go with four companies to we didn't want to we didn't want to get our we didn't want to focus. We didn't want to spread our thoughts too much. We wanted just four four to choose from. So it was uh, myself, one of our accounting managers, our CFO, and then um, one other of our on our accounting team. We kind of were the champions of it, if you will, and we kind of just threw out some names that we knew of in our other experiences. I know I did reach out to Greg and said, hey, what have you heard of? Um, give us some ideas of people to look at. So we narrowed it down um, to four and definitely getting clouded, right? Like once you get into it and you have all the meetings and you're having all these meetings at one time, you're looking at the system, you're trying to follow along. Um, it's hard. At the end of the day, we had to remember at the end of the day, they're all going to do the same thing. Okay. Yep. They are, they're all going to do the same thing. And somebody finally told us like, you know, you also have to look at customer service and really who you want to work with, like what you've learned from the people that you've reached out with, like, who did you like to work with? Who did you jive with? Um, that that's kind of where it came down to, uh, as far as you know, finally making a selection, we we were thinking about selecting two for the long haul, not just to get us through right now with what our industry is doing, but 10, 15 years from now, uh, can we change with the system and can the system change with us? So it was just one of those things to try to find that right fit. Um, reaching out to the broker, uh, utilizing some of the services or subscriptions, if you will, whether it be Society of Human Resources or the American Society of Employers and just saying, hey, what kind of info do you have of what, of what places companies are selecting? Um, and then, you know, then I decided to go on maternity leave. So it all kind of <laughs> happened, happened without me. Uh, so then just kind of getting back in the groove after leave and the main push was to get payroll first and then kind of adding section by section for the system to make it how we wanted it to be and be customizable. So um, as you can imagine, as I've mentioned, kind of an older workforce or a majority of our workforce not sitting at a desk and not using a computer for the majority of their day, having that learning curve of you have to log on to the system. You have to get your information from the system. We're using the system. Hey, guess what? We're using the system. It costs a lot of money. We're using it. <laughs> um, so yeah. just kind of reinforcing that. And again, the training, right? Um we we decided since we knew a lot of our workforce didn't sit at a computer, we provided a Chromebook to every location, and it is just the payroll and HR system book. 
You can't add, you can't use it for anything else. It's there in the office for you to log on to the platform um, and utilize it that way if you didn't like using the app on your phone um, or you didn't have a computer at home, right? Um, so we had to kind of think ahead and start start there as well, as well as you know, time clocks, right? Those had to be at every location for people to punch. So just kind of planning it to implement this new program that we really, really need and that is going to be great for all of us, but the implementation and the planning of it takes a lot of effort and time and then spreading the word and training it to our training our folks on how to use it and take advantage of everything it offers. So Greg, did I answer the question? <laughs> you nailed it. No, you did. You nailed it. You guys, I think you laid out that process really well and um Another really good takeaway for people, because I think, you know, some can relate with what you had to do in order to, look, we're doing this, we need everybody's buy-in, no matter where you are in your career horizon, right? And you took some steps to make sure that um, people had the resources they need, i.e. a laptop or whatever it was to be able to facilitate that. I see that on other sides of the house as well when I'm working with my clients and maybe they're deploying a benefits administration system for the first time where people are going to enroll online, right? They have, they have they're on the floor, they don't have access to anything like you're saying. Right. Similar type process to, uh, is undertaken. And I think that's really tangible for people to be able to take away. So, Casey, I think that was perfect. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Salha, I'm coming back to you. Before I do this, just want to make sure ever uh, the listeners know we are. Um, it's, I can't believe what time it is. We're blowing through time here, but before uh, while while I uh, before I ask all of this question, I want to remind people: if you do have questions, please use the Q and A. We're happy to answer them. I do want to leave time for that, and if we don't have any. That's great too. But I just want to remind people that no, that time's going to be coming up soon. So pop them in there if you do have questions. Um, but before we do that, I, I really want to ask you this one, Salaha, because it's something that I. Uh, that you and I have talked a lot about over time, and I've been extremely impressed with with Insource is has been your ability to really grow and find talent in a really tight labor market. Um, you guys have gone through some really tremendous growth, and um, but the thing that I, a I mean that's a compliment in itself how you've been able to do that. So we'd love for you to kind of maybe share some some tips with people relative to that. But also, I think the piece that stands out to me is how you've been able to do so while maintain within your own company values, right? You've really stuck to, um, you know, finding the right people, not just growing for the growth sake. And I think kudos to you guys for being able to do that, uh, to do both of those things. But um, more than that, maybe if you have any tips for people or take us through that journey a little bit and what you, what you all do to be able to find people, but also interview those people and um, keep them, keep your, keep your top talent, um, all those good things. Uh, if you could share just a few things, I think that'd be really helpful for, for the listeners. Sure. Um, so just for context, probably three or so. So we probably doubled in size in the last three years or so. And, um, you know, so some of it was related to the time we were in. So we provide uh, supplementary, supplemental services to finance, HR, and IT departments, but also fully outsourced services. So a lot of small businesses that couldn't imagine outsourcing some of those functions um, had to go a little more remote in terms of how they operated and so worked with us to um, develop a different way of working with their with their staff. So that sort of enabled us to grow really quickly very, in a way that was pretty exciting and uh, uh, ambitious to keep up with, we'll say. So we did a few things that really worked. So we've had dedicated recruiters for many years. And I know Greg, you and I have talked about this. So we have, so right now we're probably at maybe 190, 200 employees. We have two full-time dedicated recruiters. And we've had two recruiters now for, even when we were much smaller, we made that investment early on. And it's really been worth it. Um, not just because we find candidates, but because the recruiters that we have are very invested in the company and the values and their, I mean, our jobs are not always, the, I would think they wouldn't always be the most exciting to recruit for because they're recurring jobs. We have consultants, there's like, you know, maybe 10 jobs that are recurring and, um, but they, they know their roles inside and out. They um, fully embrace kind of the, our organizational culture and they're ambassadors for us. So what they have 
done is really created an employee exp uh, candidate experience for people. I mean, it, conceptually, we always wanted to create a good experience, but having the right recruiters has really made that come alive for us. So um, how did we do that? So we, we think we approach recruiting as, yes, we're trying to find people to do jobs, but we want the role to be as good a fit for the person as it is for us. And that's how we approach it. So um, a few different things. So the, the, again, focused attention on recruiting. Um, we, in our process is, so the, you know, three years ago, it was pretty hard for us to imagine that we would be hiring people over video. We used to do in-person interviews and all of that. And so, you know, there was a bit of a learning curve for our managers, both in terms of interviewing over video and also expanding our geography, which was a big thing that we did. So as I mentioned, we're only in two states now, we're in 26. We started um, really talking a lot about ex expanding our, you know, theoretically expanding our employee geography would expand our business, but we were really doing it to get access to more talent. So we got some of our most talented staff through in, you know, um, increasing our geographical candidate pools. And um, so what we, one of the things that we really try to do is completely put ourselves in the position of the candidate and give them ex an experience that's respectful, that's quick. I mean, we sort of had to do that, of course, in the market because there's so many people hiring, um, but we, sort of probably screen, interview, and hire within a week. And um, all of the staff that we hire interview with the recruiters who provide them with all the fundamental background information are screened. We have screening tests, writing tests, all sorts of things to um, evaluate communication skills. They meet with the consulting teams they're gonna work with. So content-based um, interviews. And I think this is the thing that you, have the hardest time getting your head around, Greg. And there are two of us, myself and the president of InSource, who interview everyone. And to me, you know, we may not always be able to do it. And I, I say interview lightly because, uh, you know, I'm not uh, doing a, you know, full technical interview for IT um, engineers. But what we figure is that if we each, we do the last two interviews, and if we can, if the candidate can build rapport with us, they could probably build rapport with our client, with our clients for one, but also um, it gives people a chance to get a, a view of the organization beyond the department that they're going to work with. Um, you know, I we didn't do it for this reason, but a lot of people tell us that they they like having that fuller view and it shows the value that we put on our hiring process. And um, we also did some very uh, tactical things like we removed, we wanted to increase the diversity of our candidate pools. And um, so we we told staff that, you know, particularly for positions that we had a little more runway for, um, you know, that we weren't going to make any decisions until we had a more diverse candidate pool. And then that just started to snowball and people started referring people and, and so forth. So we, we did really well in that. Um, and um, something um, else I was going to say. Oh, also we, um, in terms of retaining people when they come in, we do a pretty extensive orientation program. Again, the three of us that founded different parts of the company do uh, every single, we meet with every single person to do, they're in groups. Um, you know, I do core philosophy, consulting philosophies. We do history and we do high performance as a core company value. So it's it's really what our focus is now is creating an environment where people want to be. We also really, in terms of another tactical thing, really utilize referral bonuses and build a little buzz around them. So it's interesting from a client perspective, when we tell clients or we advise clients to consider referral bonuses, they seem to always want to do really small bonuses like 500 or 1,000. And we, I, I can't remember exactly what they are now, but ours go from anywhere from like 1,500 to 4,000, depending on how um, competitive and difficult the role is to fill at any given time. And people really, they get um, a bonus if someone they refer is interviewed. And then if they're hired, they get a bigger bonus. And, um, and then at our staff meetings, 
we um, do like raffles for all the people that referred people. And if you win the raffle, you get a weekend away. And I mean, like good prizes. But if you think about it, if we had to hire recruiters, we'd be paying far, far more than our best, obviously our best source of good employees or other good employees. That was awesome. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. We get some really good stuff out. Fallon, do you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just going to add that we we too do a lot of team-based interviewing because I think it's just really important, like you mentioned, that they get a sense of the vibe of the people they're going to work with, the, the culture, and the more people that they're going to interact with. I think it helps make the decision for them and for your own company too. It's like giving the voice to the employees of who they think would be a good fit to add to the group. So um, I champion that too. And I think it's worked really well, especially virtually. Um, sometimes it's hard, you know, that disconnect can be there. So that interview and adding more people, I think is really helpful. So I just want to add that too. We also do evaluation forms for everyone we interview, which I think has been key to, and we make yes. people do them before we'll do an offer. And it, it does encourage dialogue. I mean, obviously there are ratings and comments, but it encourages dialogue. And we, we get people, they, they really do fill them out. And um, the one thing I would add that I would still want to do to enhance our process more is do more interview training because we have people who are running areas interviewing, but they're not necessarily experienced interviewers. So you have people doing very technical interviews, others doing very soft skills interviews. So aligning that I think is, helpful. I agree. I think there's some groups probably in all companies that hire all of the time. So they have like a well-oiled machine. And then you get some managers who have like a couple open recs this year and they have no idea what to do. So I think training uh, is definitely key. We do assessments too. And I think it's so helpful because it's, it's allowing every candidate to be measured consistently, which I think is really important opposed to just a favoritism of, of something. It's like you, you set your key areas that you're measuring and then you can look at that across all candidates. So um, I champion that as well. I think too, just really quickly, uh, moving quickly on the candidates too. You mentioned kind of starting and finishing in a week, right? I think that's so important because I have a lot of our management staff right now that's, I need this person so bad right now. So I post the job, I review it, I send them the applicants and then we wait two weeks. And right. it's like, okay, you had really good, you had really good candidates. So it's important to get moving on it and focus on it. I mean, out of respect to them too. And I think that that's helpful. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Um, well, thank you all for this. I really appreciate everyone's time today. It's been a, a great conversation and all of your expertise is really shown today. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A real quick. So we got a good question from a broker. It's a little bit of a long one, so bear with me. Um, but it says, from a broker standpoint, when is the best time to reach out to your broker to start the process of evaluating current TPAs for your benefits admin services? Determine if you might want to make a change. Meaning, is there a certain time of the year that is more ideal or a specific amount of time leading up to open enrollment that you'd like to kind of focus in on that? So not sure if somebody wants to take a stab at that, um, if we have any takers, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to add color at some point as well. I think it probably depends. I, I don't think I'll have one specific answer because I think it's it's specific to when your open enrollment is, how frequently you meet with your broker, what information you can get from your broker. The larger you are, the more information you have at your fingertips to see if the plans are running accurately or if you need to adjust the plan. Um, so some companies might have more information earlier where they start to really say, I think we need to make a change and then can set strategy on the timing of the change, how they're going to communicate to their employees, how is it going to affect them, where some smaller companies get the information later. Um, and so they might be rushing to make that decision. But that's just kind of my general thought on it. Curious yeah, I'd say, from anyone else. <laughs> you know, I'd say selfishly from the broker side, um, when I do wear that hat, it's, um, it's I, we like to do it outside of the chaos of open enrollment, right? Even the renewal kickoff. So one of my favorite meetings of the year for clients who are interested in having this is our mid-year check-in type meeting that uh, that we that I have with my clients. And that's really a time for us to talk about a lot of different things. Um, but this is one of them. You know, how are things going? What is, how are your current TPA services today? If they do exist, 
If not, you're thinking about in- implementing an HRA or an HSA come renewal season six months from now, you know, let's really start looking into those TPAs. So I think the more organized you can get outside of the renewal chaos, the better off you're going to be to be able to do this. Um, there are some challenges depending on, I'm not sure where this person, you know, there's a lot of different a lot of different um, ways you could determine TPA, right? You could say, is it your third-party administrator relative to your self-funded plan? Or is it your third-party administrator who deals with your FSA or HRA? I think those would change my responses a little bit. But I, I think my answer uh, would still be, you know, look at look at the alternatives or start the conversation outside of it, come up with a timeline leading it up into renewal so that you could really have your make your choices, make the change, and have everything in hand for your participants come whatever the effective date of your renewal is. So that's kind of what I what I recommend: start six months out, timeline it up until whatever you want the transition date to de- to be, and then work through kind of an RFP and implementation process from there. Not too dissimilar to what Casey was mentioning on the payroll side, to be honest. A little bit of kind of a similar type process, but I think that's a great question. Thank you. Um, we did what, get one more question. We can reach out to this person individually. Um, so we, we, we don't need to take, we can take this one offline. Um, but I did just want to thank you all again for joining today. Seriously, it was great content, um, really nice back and forth. Appreciate all the time and effort that you three put into this. Uh, and Kendall, thank you for your help in facilitating and setting this all up as well. What I'd like to remind people of is thank you for attending. I should should start there. We really appreciate it. And I've been looking at the numbers and a lot of you stayed on the entire time. And thank you for that. I wasn't, I didn't think I, we'd make the full hour, but I'm glad that we did. I think we covered some really good stuff. Uh, we have some really nice new uh, new webinars and events coming up as well. And you can find those on our events page or on our LinkedIn page. And one that I'm really passionate about is our, uh, is our HR round table. And our next one of those will be March 29th. So you can find that right on our Central Group webpage. And I'm sure we'll be posting that if we haven't already on LinkedIn. And it's just a good way for HR professionals and, and, and CFOs to kind of get together and um, talk about various topics that are pertinent to you all. You kind of, we, we, we pull you up front and uh, t- see what you want to talk about and let you talk about them amongst each other and, and figure out some good strategies that each of you are taking that you could potentially take back to your respective workforces. So that's always one, but there's a ton more coming up as well. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you all again, Casey, Salha, Fallon. I, I owe you one. I appreciate it. And um, I wish you all a great afternoon and look forward to I'm um, seeing you in the not too distant future. All right, take Thanks, care, everybody. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.